Tradition number 10 will be the gift of a blade. In 2015 and 2019, couples Rune and Elizabeth Dalsis and Dorian and Charlie Used became two of the only couples in modern times to have authentic ancient Viking wedding ceremonies, complete with blood sacrifices, hog roasts, and swords. Swords, while it may come as a surprise or not given how the Norse are, were integral to the wedding ceremony. In fact, it's how a girl was even shown to be on the market. When a girl came of age for marriage, which is young, but far older than just about anywhere else in ancient Europe, a father let it be known that she was available for marriage by gifting his daughter an empty sheath she would attach to her belt or girdle. Now, this didn't mean she or her father would have to accept the first knife just plopped in. Many women in Viking culture didn't wed until their mid-twenties. If a suitor liked the girl, he would put a puko blade in the sheath, at which the girl would keep if she was interested in him as consent for him to attempt a courtship. Men would sometimes doll up these pukos to try and curry more favor. However, it is noted by some historians that girls would also place blades into other girls' holsters. It's unknown if it correlates with same-sex romance or friendship. Blades will return in prominence a few more times in this countdown. Tradition number nine is that of the pregame. In the days before a wedding, the bride and grooms would be separated so as to shed their old selves in preparation for finding their new selves with one another. For the bride, this meant being stripped of old clothing and any symbols of her unwed status, such as her kransen, a gilt circulette worn by Scandinavian girls on their heads, situated on the hairline. If you've seen the children's movie How to Train Your Dragon, the character Astrid wears one. These are symbols of virginity, and by removing her kransen in preparation for her bridal hair, which we'll touch on in the next segment, she was shedding her innocence. During this time, the bride also cleansed herself in a bathhouse. Hot stones would be placed into water to produce steam, and she would be accompanied by mother, sister, teachers, friends, or any other woman she desired the company of. The bride used birch twigs as switches on their skin to less than metaphorically beat out any dirt and symbolically wash away the bride's maiden status. Once the bath was finished, the bride was doused with cold water to close the pores and end the cleansing. Grooms didn't have it as easy as they usually do, and they also underwent symbolic rituals. His attendants would be his father, married brothers, or other married male friends. In order to rid themselves of any bachelorhood and destroy all vestiges of the unmarried self, Viking men participated in a symbolic sword ceremony by breaking into a grave. That's right, pre-wedding night, the husband-to-be would grab a pickaxe and get to work on burying the dead and retrieve a sword from an ancestor skeleton. Through this action, he entered death as a boy and emerged into life as a man reborn. After this, he too would attend the bathhouse, beat himself raw with twigs, while gaining insight and instruction on husbandly and fatherly duties from his attendants. And that's when number eight comes in, the best man. So before the theft was a reenactment and it was still the real deal stuff, the best man and or groomsmen were crucial. If a bride's family was to steal back their daughter, before the consummation occurs, this man, or men's purpose, was to literally guard the bride and fight her family. That's why he was called a best man. He was usually whatever man the groom knew who was best at fighting. And if he didn't want to risk getting his own butt kicked, well, he better bring his groom's men. The more, the better. According to country living, the presence of groomsmen and best men was also to ensure that the bride, who in many situations was literally stolen, didn't make a break for it herself. This is why the best man man stands up there next to the groom and bride instead of behind the door frame with a baseball bat waiting for his homie's new father-in-law to come break down the door. If a fight's going to break out, you need your best fighter right there ready to go or to tackle a runaway bride. Stolen or not, once you're married, it's time for number seven, the darkened threshold. The practice of the groom carrying the bride across the threshold of their new home or bedroom doorway dates back to the forcible actions taken on the Sabines as they fought tooth and nail to escape the soldiers. When it evolved and became part of a reenactment, the brides would continue to be carried through the threshold, but with a lot more steps in the process. So after that long and dramatic reenactment procession I mentioned, and the guests and the groom whipping walnuts at her the whole time to represent leaving childish things behind, since nuts, which was its name, was a child's name in ancient Rome, the bride would then be put down outside the front door. She would oil the door's hinges with melted tallow, wolf fat, or olive oil to keep out sorcery. Then she would hang some woolen strips taken out of her elaborate hairstyle on the door as a symbol of her taking over the traditional wives' duty of weaving wool, but also to represent the scraps of material torn off of the Sabines. To go inside her new home, the groomsmen would then lift the bride over the threshold and into the house's atrium. The threshold was sacred to the goddess Vesta, so Romans believed that carrying the woman across the threshold would ensure she avoid tripping, a bad omen. This, however, is also a reference to the Sabine women being carried inside of captors' homes. Number six, we move away from the Sabine reenactment-specific traditions. It's now cuffed up. 
So fun fact, it was under Romans that the detailed legal requirements for engagements, weddings, and divorce were first instituted. Given that marriage in ancient Rome was something that required strict adherence to law, it may not be surprising that it was also regarded as a contract, thus a ring was necessary. Women in ancient Rome society were given two wedding rings, an iron one and a gold one. The iron was stylized in the early times of Rome to look like or even act as a functioning key, indicating their husbands owned them and they were a homemaker. This ring was worn at home, whilst the second was worn in public to impress people. The most common type of ring associated with Roman marriages was the fede ring, which has a design showing a pair of clasped hands or an entwined couple. Less charming is how they're representative of a contract that's comparable to a farmer buying cows. The ring would act as a receipt and passing of ownership between the father to the future husband. That's why only women wore rings, because men weren't property. Going hand in hand with that last point is number five, dowry on a finger. You know that whole selfish notion that if they really love you, they'll spend a fortune on a ring because that's what you're worth? Guess where that comes from? Creepy, right? Nowadays, it can be obvious from a ring how much someone paid for it, but back in ancient Rome, looking at a ring was how you established how much a woman was worth. And you could base how much you should respect her on that. Cheap ring, that means a small dowry and an unworthy woman. Yikes. In fact, author Karen K. Hirsch notes that rings were often used for this purpose in regular business transactions in Rome, making it very possible they entered the wedding ceremony with that mindset around the 15th or 16th century. The groom would offer a ring as a sign of his serious intention, offering up some collateral that the bride could keep if he decided to back out of the engagement. Rings were sometimes used as a deposit on the expected dowry or as as a simple payment to the bride as part of her acquisition. For number four, if you got some bad luck, bouquet it. So having a pantheon of multiple gods is going to create some strong superstitions. Gods were jealous and had to be pacified with gifts and praise so that they would behave and grant wishes. Sometimes these gifts took the form of a handful of wheat or garlands and fragrant herbs. The origin of the bridal bouquet stems back to ancient Rome when bridal couples would weave greenery and blossoms into garlands and crowns scented with roses or orange blossoms, adding herbs to honor the gods and promote fertility and good fortune, says Valerie Gittleman. Strands of ivory illustrated the strong bond of matrimony and fidelity, while white blossoms symbolize sweetness and happiness. Sheaves of wheat, for example, symbolize plenty and good harvests, i.e. fertility, which alongside faithfulness were the topmost virtues of ancient marriage. These garlands would be found on the altar spaces, on the groom's head, wound into the intricate six vestal bridal hairstyle, and naturally in the cluster the bride carries, all meant to ward of evil spirits that might try to harm her. Speaking of hair and bridal beauty, how about the Roman candle for number three? I talked about the flamium in the last video about Roman marriage, but more so about what it represents and its purposes. As you may know, had you seen it, the flamium is a oak yellow color. However, it didn't start this way, rather as a vibrant orange red color designed to look like fire so it would scare off evil spirits. Also, it does explain the name flamium to you. This flamium also covered the bride's entire body in a three 60 style, and originally they were weighed down with like heavy leaf garlands, precious stones, real rocks if you're broke. This was to prevent her, or at least try to slow her down if she was to try and run away. Why the change to yellow? Sun fading on veils passed down through the centuries. The concern for evil spirits lessened. People like the color mustard yellow. I don't know, take your pick. What stayed the same was having to use a billion pins to keep the damn thing on. Thankfully, the six braid vestal virgin hairstyle was conducive to that, but it was also conducive to high hiding weapons, circling us back to the Sabine and captured bride concept. Before a bride was allowed into the marriage bed, it became code that all jewelry that could be used as a weapon by the bride would have to be removed, including hairpins, bracelets, rings, and necklaces. Turns out some smart ladies kept some blades between their veil and scalp to protect themselves from their unwanted husbands once behind closed doors. I'm sure their Sabine ancestors would have been proud of them. This one's a little odd, but you may now kiss the priest in at number two. Pre-Christianity, kissing and Rome was actually a greeting. Before you picture a hot and sloppy makeout sesh, that's not the case. I mean a peck or little brushy brush of the lips. It was done between strangers, nobility, and family. Hell, they had to put laws in place to get people to stop laying them on each other when pandemics would break out so less people would die. It wasn't a romantic thing in the slightest, common for friends to kiss one another's closed eyelids, necks, and mouths, and considered a great privilege to greet members of your own family with a kiss. This rule was not to be broken or followed incorrectly. As Christianity took root in ancient Rome, the act of kissing became shamed 
loved it, alongside nudity, intercourse, and just about anything that was natural. What did remain was the kiss of peace. These were initially acceptable between men and women, but over time, Rome went from a kiss friendly to no tongue action township. Because God forbid you kiss someone thanks for the loaf of bread you bought and feel a tingle somewhere. I know you bought bread from her every day for the last 13 years before now and kissed her thanks every time, but you never know. Today could be the day you defy God and embrace the devil. Tisk tisk, Romans. Anyways, jokes aside, despite the casual greeting kiss and the romantic kisses before marriage being banned, the kiss of peace remained. And one of the times that that kiss happened was at the marriage ceremony, where the priest would turn to the groom and absolutely lay one on the guy. After that, the groom has to turn to the bride and give her some sloppy tongue action next. Idea was that the priest passed a blessing through his mouth to the grooms and the groom would pass it to the bride. Thus, why the groom can kiss the bride and not the other way around. And last but not least, it's everyone's favorite gals, the bridesmaids, number one. Bridesmaids are as much a sight to behold as the bride herself, mostly because back in the day, they dressed almost exactly the same as the bride. Complete opposite of the downright offensive thing some of y'all have your best friends wear. Girl, if you love her, you wouldn't make her wear that shade of pink that she can't. Anyways, the Romans believed that the bride, being so pretty, is easy prey for vengeful spirits that would harm her. Thus, the bouquets, the flemium, and now the bridesmaids, aka decoy brides. These maidens' purposes were literally to confuse evil spirits. They would dress identical to each other in an outfit somewhat similar to the bride's own. Since the bridesmaids would be surrounding the bride and look so similar to one another, it was believed the evil spirits would become confused and fly off somewhere else. Reader's Digest also noted the use of bridesmaids in a similar fashion to the best man, confusing rival lovers or even criminals seeking to take the bride. As a result, the tradition of bridesmaids wearing identical dresses to the bride persisted until the 1880s. Of course, modern bridesmaids who consider the role less of an honor than a job with the terrible uniform should consider something else noted by Reader's Digest. In ancient times, bridesmaids were literally the bride's maids. At least these days, you're getting drunk on a yacht with her. First up at number 10, let's talk about the horrid Roman wedding colors. I mean, they have you out here looking like a Mick bride. I'm talking happy meal. Whoever decided that egg yolk yellow must have been the move must have hated Romans or women or both. So to paint y'all a picture, the night before her wedding, having given away her childhood dolls, a Roman girl might sleep in a tunca reca, a special white woolen robe she has to have woven herself to demonstrate her domestic skills. If you, let's say, sucked at domestic skills, you'd essentially be wearing like a pillowcase with no arms type of thing. So on the morning of the wedding day, the bride is dressed by her mother and everything she wore has to be cream or a yellow wool. It's the only material harvested from an animal while it's still alive, thus it contained animus, aka spirit. This must seem an absolutely brazenly stupid material choice given the Mediterranean climate, but keep in mind it was fun to be supremely Aryan-like. That doesn't make it any less chafy though, so. On to the egg yolk, aka flamium, the flame colored or color of egg yolk veil used to cover the bride's hair and shielded her face. It signaled the transition into a matron's pala, a huge rectangular shawl worn by wedded women. But before you slap that rain poncho on her head, don't forget to do the elaborate Sunny Creens hairstyle. What's that mean in English? Intercourse Creens. It's six special braids wound with a bunch of fragrance herbs to do with fertility, but also covers the fact people were smelly. Don't worry. You add more cotton this time to her hair in colorful strips. Last but not least, like your daughter is a present under the tree, you tie her up in a bow. More accurately, a cingulum. It's a wool belt tied with something called a Hercules knot that her husband has to be confident enough to undo on the wedding night. Toss on a pair of neon yellow slippers and you're ready to go down the aisle looking like a crumpled napkin covered in mustard. Let's go. So, marriage required giving up a lot of yourself, including your girlhood. Number nine is Bye Bye Barbie. As we all know, girls were married off while still young. But to give you like the smallest semblance of peace, many Roman emperors upheld and enforced that consummation wasn't allowed despite a marriage occurring until a woman reached a certain age. Just to ensure they didn't die unnecessarily and childbirth was a major 50-50 back then. Some women were genuinely barred from giving birth well into their 20s if their family had a bad rep of lady deaths. But the night before a wedding, no matter what happened once the knot was tied, pun intended, and no matter her age, a girl set aside dolls, old hairbrushes, and dresses and donned in matronly garb for the first time and ceremoniously burnt her old items. By dedicating her toys and useful possessions to the household gods, it became a transition in which she would emerge a woman. Even if you're like 20, you had to do this. I'm sure it didn't have to go as far as burning it, like sheesh, maybe save them for when you have a kid of your own, that way you don't have to remake and rebuy all the stuff again. Or find like a prehistoric value village to donate to, maybe. And while we're giving things away, why don't you take a second and scroll on down 
down to the red button below so you can subscribe to the hive. On number eight, shotgun wedding. Marriage and weddings back in the medieval ages were practiced very differently compared to today. Back then, people started getting married and having kids very, very young. Usually, girls would be married off as soon as they hit puberty, so around the age of 12, and they would start popping out as many spawn as possible because the high infant mortality rate made it very difficult to grow a family. On top of the duty to further the population, these marriages weren't for love. Arranged marriages were the norm back then because it was mostly used to join families for status or alignment or because your dad owed Billy from down the block a favor and he offered you to his son Billy Jr. Marriage ceremonies were also very different back then. Because marriage wasn't as big of a fuss as it is now, it didn't matter where you got married or how soon. You could get engaged in the morning and be married by lunchtime if you really wanted to. Most people didn't need permission to get married so they could hold the ceremony anywhere. Marriage ceremonies could be held in places like pubs, in the middle of the street, or even in bed. Because of this, it made it really hard to know who was was married and to whom until the 12th century when it was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. Number seven, no objections. So obviously, with a lot of people marrying willy-nilly, a lot of marriages mostly made people miserable. Maybe. Enemies to Lovers is my favorite book trope, so who knows how spicy things actually got. I hate you, I love you, next day, I don't know. But the famous line, speak now or forever hold your peace, only got introduced in 1215 to try and flush out drama before they couldn't go back. In the Middle Ages, drama discovered after marriage vows were exchanged caused major problems since divorce wasn't easy or, you know, accepted. We will get to that later. For instance, Joan of Kent, who was known for marrying Edward the Black Prince and mothering Richard II, had a secret marriage when she was 12 years old. She didn't get approved. In her early teens, she was married to an aristocrat, but the secret marriage was discovered after eight years. The papal court had to overturn it and return her to her knight. He died 11 years later, and it was after that that her cousin Edward married her. Wouldn't it have been nice to know that little detail before she married the aristocrat guy? Yeah, probably. Would have saved a lot of heartbreak. Hence why the speak now or forever hold your peace was introduced. At number six, shoes. Back in the days of old, shoes were apparently a huge staple in society. They were pointy and weird and expensive and complicated and were even integrated into marriage practices. During the wedding ceremony, it was a tradition for the father of the bride to take one of the bride's shoes and give it to the groom. The groom would then tap the bride on the head with the shoe in a token of his authority. But the shoe traditions don't stop at bopping people on the head like little bunny foo foo. You know how these days there's a tradition of throwing the bouquet at weddings, and apparently whoever catches it is the next to get married? Well, that tradition sort of came from the medieval tradition of throwing shoes at weddings. Instead of throwing flowers, brides would throw shoes at their bridesmaids to determine who was next to walk down the aisle. Now this whole bride throwing things idea has failed me before because I caught a bouquet once and I'm as single as ever. So so maybe someone needs to chuck a shoe at me or something this time. Please. Number five, the bedroom trial. So divorce, again, wasn't a thing. On the upside of dying early, it potentially meant that you weren't locked in a marriage for too long. If the marriage did end, it wasn't a divorce, it was an annulment, which was very expensive. A common reason this happened was due to consanguinity, which was close relations by blood or marriage, which was forbidden. Other grounds would be adultery, leprosy, and impotency. Also failure to concede to the marriage debt, which was the obligation for both spouses to engage sexually. It actually didn't matter where this happened. And you had to do it even if it was in a church. It was a big deal. Enter the bedroom trial. Court cases from the 14th century show records that bedroom trials took place that would determine whether a marriage should continue. The bedroom part is exactly as it sounds. The man and the woman were placed in a bed together and were to be watched by the wise women for several nights. If over the course of the night the man's member remains of no use, i.e. impotence, then it was determined that the marriage should end. But the wise women were most likely either complete strangers strangers or the groom's grandmother. So I doubt that would have helped with the getting it up part. Poor guys. At number four, marrying the country. If you married an entire country, does that count as polygamy? Are you technically married to everyone in the country or just the one country as a singular unit? These are the shower thoughts that I wish I could ask medieval queens, but unfortunately they died a long, long time ago along with their marriage secrets and probably some recipes for poison too. Back to this whole marrying the country idea though. Back in the medieval age, when someone became queen, they had to get married more than once. 
For them, it wasn't just about marrying their spouse, they also had to marry their country. This process was called consecration, and it was something that a ruler had to go through in order to be a legitimate queen. The queen would go through a symbolic marriage to the realm, complete with prayers and a blessing and a ring and a crown. It was essentially like a real wedding, except the groom was a nation of people. Sounds like a happy marriage to me. Yeah. Number three, the veil. As we have determined so far in our list, love wasn't the primary reason for marriage, especially for nobles. So as a result, there were quite a significant amount of arranged marriages. Besides the symbolism of humility and purity, it was also used as a way of disguising the bride entirely. The bride would often be wrapped from head to toe to protect her from evil spirits. This tradition goes all the way back to ancient Roman times. That's one explanation, but during arranged marriages, it was more literally used to hide the face of the bride from the groom. So if he didn't like what he saw after he literally unwrapped the package. Well, too bad, she's yours now. Eventually, veils progressed to being much smaller, but the tradition of revealing the bride to the husband to declare ownership remained a tradition, even to this day, kind of, except now it's more romantically idealized. Do you see Priyanka Chopra's awesome veil and that, you know the one. At number two, long distance marriage. You know how during the pandemic, people started having Zoom weddings? Well, in a way, people have been doing something similar since the medieval ages. Back then, a lot of weddings were simply for political reasons, and so a big ceremony was rarely needed. So when two people from different kingdoms were getting married, they didn't necessarily need to be there for the wedding. Instead, they could send proxies and have someone marry their new spouse on their behalf. This would be the legal binding of marriage, you know, the paperwork side of things. But once both parties could finally meet in person, then they would hold a second ceremony with all the pomp and circumstance that you would expect. And yes, it still included the whole watching the consummation thing. Ew. This proxy marriage actually happened to Marie Antoinette and her brother was her proxy until she could get to the formal ceremony. So now we know that even back then you didn't have to show up on time to your own wedding and you could just get someone else to do it. Sounds a little cold to me, but like I've said before, love is dead and it died a long time ago. Mic drop, thank you. Number one, last but not least, and this is the most messed up, the Lord's Rite. This one is definitely the most messed up tradition and I don't even know how it was justified in the first place. Like why was it even in place? Someone clearly clearly made this happen so they could piss people off. The last thing anyone wants at their wedding is someone interfering with the wedding night. As we know, people for the most part had to observe the ceremony, but the Lord's Rite was something even more horrific. The Droit de Seigneur was a feudal rite that existed in medieval Europe that gave the Lord of the land the right to sleep with the bride on the first night of the marriage. That's right, so most often they would take the bride's virginity. Now, just how often this rite was carried through is debated, but if your lord had a particular vendetta against you, it wouldn't be surprising. This rite could also extend to a lord taking the virginity of every woman in the village even if they didn't want to get married, it was ridiculous. However, late middle age and renaissance era texts don't clearly determine whether this practice ever occurred. Texts from 15th century Switzerland references the Lord of Mar demanding the right of the first night or a hefty fee. So either you pay for it, or I do it. The Dwight de Senor was depicted in Mel Gibson's Braveheart, which added to the infamy of the idea, but no physical evidence determines whether any lord actually did it, but it did technically exist. Gross. At number 10, watching consummation. Back in medieval times, depending on the century, weddings either meant a lot or meant nothing at all. If it was the early medieval age, then no one really gave a hoot about marriage, and I'll get to that later. But later in the medieval age, marriage became a holy sacrament, and this sacrament had to be consummated. On the night of the couple's wedding, they would do the good old brown chicken, brown cow, boom boom pow, <laughs> OMG wow, which could have been a positive or negative experience experience depending on circumstance, but it was also a little weird because there would be people watching it all happen. That's right guys, after the ceremony and reception, people would follow the bride and groom up to the bedroom and be like, hey Joe, grab the popcorn, we're watching the live showing of Fifty Shades of Grey, and Joe would be like, yo bet, and then that's exactly how it happened. Anyways, this was all done so that there were witnesses to the consummation so that the marriage's validity could be backed up. So if anyone tried to deny that their marriage was legit, Joe with the popcorn would be able to back up the bride and groom and confirmed that everything happened. Kind of kinky, kind of weird. Number nine, dowries. Today's weddings are in so insanely expensive. I don't know if it's ever gonna happen for me for that reason alone. But uh, you know, they kind of replaced the dowry altogether. But what was a dowry? It was a set of assets, money, material, goods, real estate that would be given to the groom once the couple 
united. The purpose of the dowry was to entice a groom to marry the bride if he wasn't already attracted to her. A kind of, we will pay you to marry our daughter kind of vibes. But it also acts as a kind of insurance for the bride. Should the marriage end in divorce, the husband is expected to pay it back. So yes, there were indeed take backsies if things got really bad. Though considering divorce and annulments were rare and the money really never belonged to her, not the best rule to live by, but the groom would also pay something called the bride price or bride wealth. The groom was expected to pay a sum, either in assets or money, to secure a lady's hand in marriage. This implied security for the bride and their family. But yes, in both accounts, technically, a bride could be bought and sold for whatever price the family slash groom deemed appropriate. So really just a marriage pawn. Tradition number eight is, as mentioned, the bridal crown. The bridal crown represents a literal crown, but also that of a natural crown, aka hair, which was more crucial to the Vikings than any other part of a woman, as it symbolized virility and sensuality. When it came time for her to remove her crown sin, the bride would receive her bridal crown from her mother. This bridal crown would be adorned with endless ornaments, crystals, animal bones, rune stones, but it could also be made of purely natural materials and decorated with flowers, straw, wood, and vines. The longer the hair and the more ornaments it had, the better off the couple was believed to be. The next morning, the bride's hair would be tied up and covered with a cloth to show her status as a wife. Married Viking women would not always continue to cover their hair, but would wind it back into braids buns, ponytails, and other risen hairstyles. Tradition number seven is in the garb. The hair of the bride was the most important aesthetic element. Everything else seemingly falls by the wayside. The bride often wore a long linen gown embellished with beads or intricate embroidery. The groom donned his newest and brightest of tunic and trousers, and also often linen and embroidered. Both parties would don a belt, and the groom's being a symbol of his strength and ability to protect. The more weapons holstered, the better, but the groom always carried a pickaxe or hammer at least. The bride's was a symbol of her fertility, the clasp of her bridal belt intricate and dainty, drawing the eye as a reminder of what is to come when she and the groom are alone. Vikings loved to wear jewelry and wedding attire was no exception. The bride would wear a necklace, earrings, bracelets, often made of silver or gold and often more than one layer. The groom would wear a brooch or an arm ring symbolizing his status and power. The final layer would be exactly that, an extra layer. Vikings lived in cold climates and it was common for them to wear coats or cloaks to keep warm. Seeing as the Viking wedding ceremony exclusively happened outside. No matter the season, a fur coat usually was of great importance. The groom's coat was usually a dark color an animal he or a man in his family had personally hunted. This shows his prowess as a man and his role as a provider. The woman's fur coat would be a pale color, a symbol of her purity and as the sweet animal captured by the ferocious hunter. Tradition number six is tying the knot. This classic wedding phrase is one that used to be quite literal. Called a hand fasting ceremony, a multitude of pagan religions had their own versions of this. For example, the Roman brides as mentioned in the Bumblebee video top 10 scary marriage traditions in ancient Rome wear an intricate knot belt that must be undone by the groom. The use of the knot to symbolize the joining of couples originates with the Celts who were famous for the symbolic use of knots and knot patterns. Hand fasting in the most traditional of senses was done by the Vikings wherein the couple's hands are tied together with some cord or cloth by the officiant quite literally binding them and officiating their marriage. They are tying the knot. Moreover this practice was important to the Vikings as it indicated that the couple was getting married by choice, not by force. The couples I mentioned at the beginning of our video incorporated hand fasting in their ceremonies, but even those not recreating Viking weddings still participate as the trend is popular in Europe. Apart from exchanging rings, house keys, and tying the knot, the Viking bride and groom also exchanged swords. This symbolized the transfer of protection between the grooms and the bride's families. They would each exchange ancient swords from their own families, thus why the groom went and dug one up pre-wedding night. Furthermore, it united of the two families that were now responsible for supporting and protecting one another. Tradition number five is the godly blessing. First and foremost, Viking weddings always and only took place on Fridays, otherwise known as Frigg's Day or Freya's Day, as the queen goddess represented marriage, love, and fertility. To hold a marriage on any other day than one of the Norse goddesses would have been a bad omen. Viking wedding rituals stated that the wedding also had to be held between the end of the harvest and before the snowfall, and that you needed to accumulate enough food and shelter for everyone invited. You also had to have enough bride ale for the new couple to drink for the first moon cycle of their wedding. Meanwhile, during the feast post ceremony, the hammer or pickaxe that the groom carries as part of his groom's attire would finally play its role. The bride was expected to ask for Thor's blessing, and so the pickaxe or hammer wielded by the groom, meant to represent Majon, is placed on the bride's lap. The placement of the symbol of Thor's manhood in between the bride's womb and hoo-ha is highly symbolic, as he 
represented male fertility and was believed by playing into this cruel joke, he may deliver you, the bride, strong children. Tradition number four is a cat in a box. As the groom would hand over his house keys to the bride, the congregation of those witnessing the wedding would bestow the gift of life to fill the home in preparation for children. Cat. Lots of cats. This was done in to honor Freya, the goddess of love, who according to legend, drove a chariot led by cats. Nursing female cats and their kittens were often seen as the most ideal to give as they would be a representation of the bride's future to come, and help her set up the household and get into the routine of caring for something small and defenseless. Well only semi. I've had my fair share of cat scratches and bites. I would argue they defend themselves just fine. Tradition number three is honeymoon. Have you ever wondered where the word honeymoon came from? Well it comes from the Scandinavian practice of drinking honey mead, which nowadays is pretty hard to get a hold of. It takes a long time to make small batches and requires tedious preservation. But man, it is incredible, so if you get a chance to try it, you absolutely should, as long as you're over 19. And you needed enough of this delicious honey mead made and provided by friends and family to last you the entire duration of your first moon cycle, one month after your wedding, as it was believed to increase the chance of conceiving a child. As you can imagine, loose inhibitions would lead to a higher likelihood. It's also a legal requirement for the bride and groom to drink bride ale together at their post-wedding feast, as their union was only binding once they did so. The first serving was presented to the groom by his wife in a vessel known as the Loving Cup. The bride might recite a formal verse while presenting the ale. Before drinking it, the groom consecrated the ale to Thor by making the sign of the hammer over it, and toasted to Odin. He sipped and passed the cup to his bride, who made a toast to Freya before drinking. Tradition number two is giving chase. When your wedding ceremony is done nowadays, the bride and groom leave while their attendees applaud and whoop, and everyone meets with everyone later, sometimes at a secondary location for post-wedding festivities. However, in Viking weddings, this wasn't the case. Your first job as a bride and groom was to aggressively compete in a competition as if you were children again. A race. Called the bride running, or alternately, the bridegroom's ride, this ritual originated in pagan days where the bridal and groom parties, as well as the bride and groom's additional guests, had to race to the feast location. Whichever party lost served liquor to all the winnings all night. You better hope you have an athletic family. Once in the feast hall, the groom buried the sword into the ceiling, and the depths of which the sword sunk symbolized the enduring nature of the union. Things changed in the Christian days, however, and the fun run turned simply into the two parties walking separately from the site of the ceremony to the feast, which is how we've ended up with the far more boring modern version we do today. When Christianity spread, it also carried the tradition of the marriage door from Rome. The Christian Viking version was the groom actually blocking the door so that the bride had to enter with his assistance, completing her symbolic journey from maidenhood to marriage. Tradition number one is animal sacrifice. Despite the wealth of Viking wedding knowledge that seems to be available, I will commentate briefly on how reconstructing their ceremonies has proven to be immensely difficult. This is because when the Viking sagas were first written, Christianization had already started wiping out their traditional cultures, temples, rune stones, and overall beliefs, leaving many details undocumented or struck off the record. However, we are very confident that sacrifice made its way into marriage ceremony. The sacrifice was to draw attention of the gods to the ceremony and assure their presence and blessings, and so animals associated with fertility were the ones used. For Thor, a goat. For Freya, a sow. And for Freya, a boar or horse. The Gothi, the person responsible for the wedding, usually sacrificed the animal right at the wedding site. The animal's blood was collected in a bowl and placed on the altar. Then, a bundle of fur twigs was used to be dipped in the blood and splatter it on the couple, conferring the blessings of the gods. The blood is then drizzled over little figures of the gods placed at the altar, all meant to symbolize the union of them and regular people. And yes, Rune and Elizabeth, Dalseth, and Dorian and Charlie Eust are couples who recreated authentic Viking weddings in 2015 and 19, also included this part of the ceremony. And the wedding traditions of both ancient Rome and the ones of our modern day, we need to learn about number 10, the women of Sabine. So if you haven't seen it yet, we recently released the top 10 messed up marriage traditions in ancient Rome, and I definitely recommend giving these two videos a watch consecutively. As in that one, you'll learn more about the traditions in the ceremony ceremony itself, this video more nitty gritty baby. So to recap, this story first takes place when Rome was first established, like fresh off the press, just a small military settlement in 753 BCE. As a result, its entire population was men, which don't get me wrong, Roman soldiers could work with the same way Greek ones could, but because their mommies had done all the work for them their entire lives and now they can't wash dishes or even a shirt, they sought out replacement mommies, aka wives. Where and how do you get wives when there are no women? 
The answer to that question was to steal any women of childbearing age from the neighboring township of Sabine. These women were ripped from their mothers and fathers and carried in large processions back to Rome where they were forced into marriage via physicality. Their fathers, brothers, and former husbands came to wage war and win the women back, but the women of Sabine felt it was too late. Now forced into motherhood and marriage to the soldiers, the women of Sabine throw themselves in between the evil men who are now the fathers of their children and the men who they'd been stolen from, begging that bloodshed end, wanting to live neither fatherless nor widowed. So a truce is called, and Sabine and Rome united their communities. So let's do a traditional breakdown in the following part of the countdown. What traditions ended up coming from this? Number nine will be stolen goods. So one result of Rome literally starting off as a mass theft of ladies and their autonomy, it developed a super fun mindset and tradition that the only bride of value was one that hadn't been deflowered and had been stolen from her family. This went in two directions. So first, marriage continued to be theft, not like a ha ha ha, steal the bride. This was like actual theft of a person and a forceful marriage. This is how it was in the early days of Rome for a few hundo years. Obviously it can't stay that way forever because people do feel love and some people want to get married in a non effed up way, so the tradition goes the second way, that theft would be continued but as a consenting reenactment. In a consenting reenactment after the marriage ceremony, a bride would hug her father, then hold her mother, at which point the guests and the groomsmen would pull her from her mother's arms in a recreation of what happened to the Sabines, and that she should cry out in pain and weep as she was heralded along the route to her new house, even if they were faking it, just as the Sabines had. Now as mentioned, Roman emperors had some more really than a little say in marriage. So number eight is all about how it was governed by law. There were very specific laws governing marriage, and these laws evolved depending on the era, the emperor in control, and then when Christianity entered the empire. Pretty consistently, a proper Roman marriage could not take place unless the bride and the groom were Roman citizens or had been granted special permission called a conibium. So more on the laws around that in a later point. At one time in Roman history, those who had been owned people, now freed, were forbidden to marry citizens. This restriction was relaxed by an Emperor Augustus who passed a reform in 18 BC called the Lex Julia, so that by the first century, freed peoples were only prohibited from marrying senators. Augustus instead insisted on other restrictions on marriage. Citizens weren't allowed to marry working girls or actresses, and provincial officials were not allowed to marry local women. Soldiers were only allowed to marry in certain circumstances, and marriages to close relatives were forbidden. Finally, unfaithful wives divorced by their husbands could not remarry. In the Republic, there was a stipulation that if the bride is uh, not deflowered, her husband should only sleep beside her for at least one night without engaging in physical touch. The aim of that was to give women a chance to get used to a new situation. Another thing meant to help her get used to a new situation, number seven, the mutinas tutinas. So we know about this tradition through some very, very angry church fathers and their many documented temper tantrums. One famous account is Christian apologist Arnibus, who angrily scribbled that the Roman matrons were taken for a ride on Tutinus with its immense shameful parts. In reality, what he's actually describing with a lot of hostility and hypocrisy as an obscene loss of purity was actually a ritual that allowed brides to have autonomy and learn not to be embarrassed by the act of intercourse and their bodies role in it, in an era where that didn't get to happen. So stop being mad bro, it can't always be about men. The ritual goes that before the consummation of her marriage, a Roman woman had to go through the process of deflowering herself. In order to do that, she made her way to the temple of Mutinus and the marriage deity and sat on his appendage. She didn't have to do more than a quick sit if she didn't want to, it was up to the woman. Someone had to do the sit down, ouch, okay, time to get up and leave, got lots of wedding planning to do, while other women would you know? So whatever kind of woman you are, once you walked out of that temple, albeit now a little bit bow-legged, you were also now able to have proper relations with your new husband. And a deity being your first penetration would guarantee fertility and healthy children. As also mentioned previously, their society aimed for women not to have relations on the first night anyways, and rather sleep beside their husband. Unfortunately, both these practices degenerated and took women's rights with them. We've done a lot of build-up to it, so let's make number six all about how Roman weddings have one wacky 
ceremony. First of all, a marriage ceremony was commonly held, although there was actually no legal requirement for such. In law, all that was required was for the bride to be led to the groom's house. The groom did not have to show up. He could quite literally be wed in absentasia via a letter of intent. There's some confusion about which rituals relate to which types of marriage and from what time periods, seeing as there was three kinds of marriage and a lot of different eras of the Roman Empire. Purchase, which is the usual, it's always existed. Usage, super archaic, where a man and woman could spend a year together unmarried, do whatever they want, and once it's hit the one year point, if the woman stays another three days, they're officially married. Then one last came into play later in the empire, and that was alongside Christianity. It had a religious character involved. In earlier times, either a lamb was sacrificed and its skin spread out for the bride to sit on, or a sow was sacrificed to Mother Earth. Either route, an auspex read the entrails to determine the fate of the couple. Then the bride unveiled herself, power move, and the couple stood face to face. In later times, when vows were introduced, she would say, where you are the male, I am the female, and he would respond, ubi tu gaia, ego gaius. Rings or coins were then given to the bride. A contract was signed if it was desired, like a prenup agreement today. Both families could stipulate terms around children and in finances, such as a dowry. The Roman marriage ceremony, called a dextratum incotio, literally means joining of hands. The last component found in all times of the empire was a handshake that signifies the concordia, a mutual bond of affection between the married couple using their right hands. The couple then share a ritual spell cake that the groom broke above the bride's head, not like a bottle style, in a let me crumble this above your elaborate hairstyle to feed your head lice kind of way. And then after the wedding comes the domum deductio, number five. So it's a big old procession and the most important part of the wedding day, signifying a public acknowledgement of the wedding. The procession could begin at the bride's family's hearth with a ritual where she would be pulled from her mother's arms and a demonstration of the bride's modesty and sadness of leaving the family home. The entire procession then paraded to the groom's house and the bride specifically was escorted by three younger men, one carrying a torch and the other two would be holding her arms. They are followed by the pranuba, five white pine torches that are carried to honor Cerces, an earth fertility goddess. The bride then has a bouquet of distaffs or spindles to nod to her duty as a wool maker for the family. Then would come the couple's friends and family behind them. Anyone else could join the procession and many people did just for fun, all while throwing candied nuts at the bride. The groom received the bride at the door, which she entered with the distaff and spindle in hand. And at the threshold, the bride adorned the doorway post with the fat of a pig to honor Cerces, the fat of a wolf to honor Rome, and then remember those raw wool strips all up in her hair? They get added to the door too. After she's finished her arts and craft project, the husband would present her the household keys. In pagan times, she'd do a consent chant. Then he'd sweep her up and carry her in the doorway since tripping was a bad omen. Guests were invited in for a meal and only left when it was time to undo Hercules knot. Like levels in a video game, now outside the bedroom door, the groom presents the bride fire and water, the elements of the household maintenance. The bride touches each and then her husband would undo the knot, even if fortification wasn't to occur and just like that, you're married. And you may be wondering how to congratulate the happy couple. Well, don't worry because that's number four in the countdown. So as mentioned, if you're hanging around in a procession, whether part of the wedding party or just an everyday Joe, you get to hug handfuls of dried candied fruits and nuts at the bride. Walnuts were most popular for this, which I feel would be the worst kind of nut to get stuck in your hair, but maybe getting a dried apricot thrown at you and bouncing off your cranium isn't much better either. As I'm sure you can tell, this was the cultural precursor to throwing rice, confetti, and bits of paper, which probably resulted in fewer brides with eye injuries. As an attendee, you can yell feliciter, which means good luck, or talisio, which even in the times of the late republic was an archaic word. There were most definitely obscene songs. Naturally, they were sung by men and children in the procession on my personal favorite, this little hand sign. This is Manofico, representing good luck, fertility, protection from the evil eye. However, in modern Italian culture, it's evolved into an intercourse-based insult, so don't go busting it out at weddings. Now here's a question I've heard a few times, and I love answering stuff. So, who can marry who is number three. If you went back in time and asked a Rowan their perspective on interracial marriage, they'd be so confused by your question, they'd probably miss the fact that you're wearing Air Maxes. Fun fact, kids, but most of those ancient worlds didn't have a racial categories. A Briton and a Syrian? African and Romanian? Caribbean and Native American? What's Latin for whatever's yo? Because they didn't regard such things as fundamentally wrong the way that modern crappy people can. The evidence seems to show that ethnicity played a little part once a group was Romanized. If they acted, dressed, and behaved as a Roman, then to most, they were
were a real Roman. That meant you could marry another Roman. Don't even ask me about same sex relationships because those were laughably normal. But hear what I mentioned, Roman and Roman. That's because the big Roman taboo was class mixing. A great example is how a barbarian and a Roman citizen couldn't marry. Not on the grounds of race mixing or same genders, but actually on pure legality. Marriage had to be between two Roman Empire citizens. Barbarians, who were anyone living in the regions around Rome but not part of the Roman Empire, did not have conubium, which is aka the right to specifically marry Roman citizens. This applied to even the Greeks, who were held above the other barbarians for being similar enough to the Romans. If a marriage between a Germanic and a Roman tried or did successfully happen, man, y'all could be beige, pink, black, green, blue, boys, girls, all in between. It's a scandal. One that could be subjected to a court case or even a death sentence. Let's talk about number two, the Roman divorce. Prior to the late Republic, divorce was virtually unknown. Changes in marriage laws allowed for women to keep control of her dowry, and this made divorce and self-sustenance more viable option for women. And it was also simple. Just so simple. Just as a marriage was only a declaration of intent to live together, as mentioned, really all that's necessary is a procession to the groom's house, divorce was just a declaration of the couple's intent not to live together. All that law required was that they declare their wish to divorce before seven witnesses. An ex-wife could expect to receive her dowry back in full and then return to her father's possession. If she'd been independent before the wedding, i.e. orphan freed woman, she would regain her independence. Under the Lex Julia, founded by Augustus, a wife found guilty of adultery in special court might sacrifice the return of half her dowry, and it allowed her dad to kill her, or just about any man, really creepy. Divorce for infertility, always assumed to be the woman's fault, was valid given that bearing children was pretty much the point of the marriage thing, and also political advancement was another valid reason for divorce. In the late Republic, Cato the Younger divorced his wife Marcia so that she could marry someone else and he could forge links with the orator Quintus Horentius, the only way he could climb in rank. Cato loved Marcia and missed her deeply, so when Horentius dies a few years later, Cato was now a high ranking man and remarried his now very rich ex wife. The last and the craziest on the list is number one. Where did it all come from? All these traditions, all these centuries. Roman weddings have had some of the most influence on traditions we still have today. Even the language, like tying the knot. But I have to come to bear some horrible, horrible origins for all of these traditions. The taking of Sabine women. The story is set when the village of Rome was first established in 753 BCE. Its population was almost entirely men, with only a small handful of already married women who are now too scared to leave their home. So what's the answer to prehistoric evil men? Steal women of childbearing age from the neighboring township of Sabine. These girls are then forced into marriages through physicality. So when their fathers and brothers and previous husbands come to wage war and retrieve their women, the women are now mothers and throw themselves between the evil men who are now the fathers of their children and then the men who they'd been stolen from, their family. Historians say this is because women supposedly felt so much guilt over the bloodshed that started in their names. They wanted to live neither fatherless nor widowed. So a truce is called and the Sabines and the Romans unite their community. There's a lot to be said here about motives for consent, notions of honor and family, female trauma, and the history being very obviously written by a man. So for now, let's focus on the fact that many Roman weddings refer to this legendary empire shaping event. The hairstyle of six braids, it's parted with a spearhead to represent the violent capture of the Sabines, pulling the daughter from her mother's arms, and her family, taking her away in a procession to her new husband's home. Women carried across the threshold to avoid tripping a bad omen. It's a reference to Sabine women being forcibly carried or dragged into their captors' homes. Plutarch gave more explanation to the meaning of that wedding word, talisio, including the fact that it's the name of one of the Sabine abductors and wool related. Thus all the wool necessary in the wedding and the scraps being left around his front door. All of these traditions are incorporated into ancient Roman weddings after the atrocity united communities to try and ritualize the event that joined the two nations and create a bond from it, rewriting the tragedy into unity and celebration. And now, we still do some of these things today. At number 10, Veil. Through this video, you will come to find out that a lot of the wedding traditions that we practice these days have some pretty messed up origins. We'll get through a lot of them throughout this list, but let's start off by talking about the bride's veil. These days, a lot of brides choose to wear a veil on their wedding day. With so many different styles to choose from, this accessory is known to add that extra little pizzazz, little spice to the look. But throughout history, veils were used for different things, some of them being a tad bit messed up. 
just a smidge. The rather obvious reason for brides to wear a veil back in the day had to do with religion and staying modest. But this hasn't been the only reason for veils. In ancient Rome, brides wore veils because it was believed to be effective at warding off evil spirits. The most messed up reason for the veil though, at least in my opinion anyway, has to do with the wedding transaction so to speak. Since back in the olden days, marrying your daughter off was seen as more of a transaction, brides would wear veils to cover their faces and they wouldn't be lifted until after they were proclaimed husband and wife so that the groom wouldn't be able to back out if he didn't like how his bride looked. Seems pretty messed up to me, but what are your thoughts on it? Tell us down in the comments. Number 9. When Doves Cry I've been to one wedding where they released doves, like actual real life doves, and I was like, do they actually do this? I couldn't believe my eyes. I didn't know it was a real thing. Why do we do this? Well, because doves mate for life, and they build a nest, and then they Netflix and chill until the end of their dove days. Sounds like perfect symbolism if I've ever heard it. Back in ancient Roman and Greek times, doves were often used as gifts from the bride to the groom. Pretty shitty gift if you ask me. Here's a bird that we now have to both take care of. The snow white ring neck dove is used by magicians. They can't fly too well, they don't have a homing instinct, whereas rock doves, the ones commonly used in weddings that we see fly away over Nana's head, they have a homing instinct for hundreds of miles, so they're perfect for the gig. But they couldn't be released during foul weather and they needed two hours before the sun sets in order for them to fly home. The wedding band has less rules than the doves. That's amazing, they're riders much smaller. If you were to catch one of these doves at a wedding, you were also allowed to keep it back in the day. Also, great hands. I don't know who's catching birds or why they want to keep it and put it in their pocket, but you do you. In our number eight spot today, we have the bridal veil. There are a lot of historical wedding traditions that have to do with warding off evil spirits. People were really concerned about that back in the day. This is one of the major factors behind why the bridal veil was created. Back in Roman times, the veil was actually a red sheet called a flamium, which was meant to look like fire so as to scare off any evil spirits that were lurking around. In Greek, the veil was often yellow for the same reason. Over time, the color changed, but the intent remained the same. It was worn as a sort of protection. In the end, another reason for the use of the veil was to assist in arranged marriages. What I mean by this is that back in the day, when marriage was simply more of a business exchange than anything, sometimes veils were used to hide the identity or appearance of the bride from the groom. Definitely not the most kind tradition there's ever been. In our number seven spot today, we have wedding rings. Both wedding and engagement rings are common in our society today, but this practice has been around for quite some time, although it used to mean a very different thing. The tradition of wedding ring exchange can be traced back to ancient Rome, but it wasn't an exchange that happened between partners at the wedding ceremony, and was instead something that was given by Roman men to the father of the bride as a symbol of his purchase. This practice later evolved into the bride being given a gold ring that she would wear, which was meant to symbolize the fact that the groom had placed his trust in her. He was trusting her with his property. As for the reason we wear rings on our fourth finger, well, rings have been worn on many fingers throughout history, but the reason why this finger was chosen was because it was believed that the fourth finger held a vein that led to the heart, which in Latin was called the vena amoris, or the vein of love. In our number six spot today, we have the bridal auction. Ancient Mesopotamia had a slew of rules and customs regarding marriage. There's one thing that the Roman historian Herodotus recorded quite well. While many of his stories are largely unreliable, this is one ancient wedding custom that has thankfully been lost to time. The bridal auction was exactly what it sounds like. It was an annual market where young, available women were auctioned off to be married. Those who were considered more beautiful were auctioned off first, and those who were deemed less desirable were auctioned after, along with a quote, monetary compensation, which was said to make up for their appearance. Harsh. Some of the most wealthy men in the area would come to the auction to find the most attractive girl possible, but even some of the men without a bunch of money came to bid a bit later in the game. In our number five spot today, we have wedding baths. This is one of the most serious of all of the wedding traditions that were seen in ancient Greece, and it was a key part of the pre-wedding rituals for brides-to-be. This ritual bath involved water being carried in a special ceremonial vase called the lutrophore to the bride's chamber for this bathing practice. This ritual was actually so important to the people of the time that much of the time, should a young woman meet an untimely fate before being married, they would still perform this bathing 
ritual on the woman post-mortem. Sometimes they would even be buried with the ceremonial vase as well, even though they had never had the chance to marry. This ceremony was intended to purify the bride and also to enhance her ability to have children. It was seen as the most important milestone in a girl's journey from adolescence into adulthood. In our number 4 spot today we have courtly love. So we've discussed a bit about how medieval marriages were mostly about the transferring of wealth and land and really didn't have much if anything to do with love. This would obviously be a less than ideal way of living so to make things a little more bearable there was the practice of courtly love. This of course was for members of the court and it allowed lords and ladies to experience love despite their marital status. This was actually a huge hit and so many people became involved that there ended up being a list of rules posted, one of which included the rule, marriage is no real excuse for not loving. The courtly love saw people doing things such as dancing and giggling, and if they really wanted to get a little risque, they'd even hold hands. Sex, of course, was forbidden, however, because there are some boundaries while you're married, alright? It's just sad that people were in these loveless marriages and had to resort to things like this, all because they simply weren't allowed to marry for love. I am glad, though, that they were able to have some kind of freedom, I guess. In our number three spot today, we have double consanguinity. Double consanguinity is the case that comes up when there is consanguinity from two sources, meaning some sort of familial relationship from two places. This was important in medieval times because it was common for two siblings in one royal family to marry two siblings from another royal family. The children of these couples would be considered double first cousins. They would be allowed to marry as first cousins, but they technically had an even closer biological relationship than first cousins did. This might be a little strange to a lot of us now, based on most of our ways of living and the law, but these rules were formed before the concept of genetic relationships and DNA was even known, so there of course would seemingly be nothing wrong with it during those times in history. In our number 2 spot today we have the Viking party. Ok, we've all been to a wedding before where we maybe got a little too loose, had a little too much fun, but let me tell you right now, no one did it like the Vikings. An important aspect of a Viking wedding ceremony was mead. It was a legal requirement for the bride and groom to drink a specially brewed bride ale together at the feast that took place after the wedding ceremony. It was an important step in making sure that the marriage was a binding one. The happy couple would need to ensure that there was at least a month's worth of ale ready for the wedding day and it needed to be continually drunk throughout their honeymoon as well. The first serving of the bride ale was presented to the groom by his new wife in what was known as the loving cup. Before the groom takes his first sip, he would likely consecrate the ale to Thor by making the sign of a hammer over it and a toast to Odin, then he would sip the ale before passing the cup to his wife. She would then make a toast to Freya before having her sip and then it was officially party time. In our number one spot today we have purity. Of course women have been subject to the weird standards of purity for hundreds and hundreds of years, but it was so bad in the medieval times that it was very common for women to have to take a type of purity test in order to assure her new husband. We won't get into the multitude of reasons why that is both horrible and extremely bizarre because we would be here all day, but I will talk about this test that they felt necessary necessary to do. For royals, the wedding night was usually watched by observers, which is very weird, but in an even weirder turn of events, after the marriage was consummated, it was normal for the sheets to be checked for blood. For people who were lower class, they didn't usually have observers, but there was apparently a rule for these couples that would allow the local ruler to have sex with the bride on her wedding night before the groom. But this is debated by some historians, and I truly hope that this one is actually untrue. Number 10, divorce. Today, divorces can go either which way. Way one, it's a brutal, awful experience for everyone around you. Words are exchanged, property is fought over, and by the end, two lawyers are a couple grand richer, and now the kids get to say dad's house and mom's house. Wow, sounds awful. Or it can be a more pleasant experience where both parties mutually agree it's no longer working out and they do their best to have a peaceful separation on everyone's behalf. That's nice, and it does happen sometimes. Well, medieval marriage and divorce looked a lot different. Who would have thought? 800 years ago, who would have thought? The main part of divorce really was just being the annulment of the marriage, assuming it was allowed. Rules change depending on when and where it was. Whereas today, like my long-winded joke at the top of this segment, there's much to consider in a divorce, especially the estate. That's probably the main thing, is, is the stuff. 
It's all about the stuff. The marriage itself is the least of people's worries today. But back then, it was just about just not being married anymore. I want the bricks in the house. Like, what are you gonna, in medieval times, what are you gonna fight over? Like, I want the cows, the cows is mine. Number nine, off with the head. Another way to solve the issue of divorce and marriage was to get rid of your spouse. The same way Polly Walnuts got rid of Mikey Palmis. Gabish. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Most famously, King Henry VIII dispatched a few of his wives as the church really gave him no other way out of the marriages he found himself in. So, you know, off with the head. However, I think it's important to note that King Henry wasn't the only bloated throne sitter to have his wives dealt with soprano style. Things weren't exactly fair for women back then, or at all. Least of all, the, the law. It didn't have everyone's best interest and justice in mind, especially women. So there was a good chance that if the king didn't like you, you were gone. Happened all over. At number eight, best man. These days, the role of the best man normally goes to the guy who's closest to the groom, whether that's a brother or a best friend. But back during the time where women were married off like property, the role of the best man was very different and was all about protecting one's assets. Back then, bride napping was actually very common, so if there was someone else who wanted to marry someone who was already promised to another person, they might try and steal her away for themselves. Yeah, why? I don't know. This is where the best man came in. The best man's job was to protect the bride, and if she was stolen, the best man would be the one to enter whatever battle or duel was necessary to get the bride back. The best man was literally there to be the best fighter. The best man was also there to watch over the bride to make sure that she didn't try and make a run for it herself. They really said, try to derail this wedding and see what happens. Number seven, a June wedding. As we're counting down this list slowly but surely, you've probably begun Begun fantasizing maybe about your own wedding one day. Maybe it's a beach wedding, maybe it's themed like a winter wonderland. Doesn't that sound cozy? It's your big day, get creative. They say the best month to get married is June, and from a Canadian point of view, I can absolutely agree with that. In ancient Roman times, however, getting married in June was a must, not just a thing you wanted to do. See, June was the month of the god Juno. They protect women in life when it comes to marriage and childbirth, so if it's between that and like, I don't know, Halloween, obviously we're gonna go with June. Better omens for sure. Another myth is that bathing was rarely done back then, so when majority of the population did finally you know, wash up. At the end of May or beginning of June, that's often when it would happen. Everybody smelt nice, they felt good, and they wanted to celebrate. So it was perfect timing. Better get me while my pits smell good, you know? That's a myth, but I can also see it checking out. A June wedding in ancient Roman days was also done so that after a spring birth, the mother can quickly hop back into action and help with that summer's harvest. Maternity leave who? Never heard of her. At number six, hashtag twinning. You know how at weddings the bridesmaids are usually wearing matching outfits? Well, this tradition dates back centuries, though it has changed slightly over the years. Remember how I mentioned that people would sometimes try to kidnap the bride on her wedding day? Well other than the best man and the groomsmen trying to play their part in protecting the bride from being taken, the bridesmaids also played a part in that too. The bridesmaids used to dress identically to the bride so that it would make it harder to spot her and therefore prevent anyone from kidnapping her. This practice dates all the way back to ancient Rome and feudal China and didn't really start to fade out of tradition until around the 1880s. These days you get a couple of gifts from the bride for being in her posse, but back then you didn't get anything Thing, and you had to risk your safety for your girl Becky, who doesn't even want to marry Jeff down the block. I don't know. Number five, a toast. My favorite part of a wedding has to be the speeches or the toasts. They're always way too long or too personal or you know what, just too depressing. Just way too sad, just tears. You're like, why, why are we talking about this? It's a nerve wracking part, even as a guest, just to get up randomly and be like, okay, look at me everyone, hi. No, I don't want to do that. Back in the 1800s though, only men were allowed to give these toasts. The oldest friend, the groom, the best man, and then the father of the bride. The whole thing would have been done in eight minutes. Guys suck at speeches. They're just like, uh, uh, a lot of ums, that's all I'm saying. Wedding toasts go back as far as the sixth century BC. When Greeks were getting married, the father of the bride would drink the first glass of wine just to make sure it wasn't poisoned or anything. Romans would also drop a piece of burnt toast into the wine in order to make the wine taste less bitter, hence the term Toast. Yeah, now we get it. Yeah, wine was so bad back then, they had to use burnt toast crystal light just to get through the day. Yuck. At number four, transaction. I find it to be just a 
little bit messed up, how before now, marriage was mostly about money or status and not about love. For a long time, people didn't get to choose who they got to marry, and there was almost always some kind of monetary transaction involved in the wedding. This whole idea here is a reason for the traditional act of the bride's father walking her down the aisle and giving her away, so to speak. In the past, fathers of the bride and groom would come together to establish an agreement, like X amount of money for someone's daughter or whatever. Once that was set up, the wedding became a big deal to see if the transaction would actually go through, and many precautions were put in place to make sure that no one backed out. One of those precautions was the act of the father walking his daughter down the aisle. This was done so that they stayed close to one another in the off chance that the groom or his family decided to back out. That really took the romance and sparkle out of weddings now. Number three, wedding cake. As the youngest of three, I can confirm that we get away with the most. The youngest often do. The middle child is just plain ignored, and then the oldest, well, they usually have the most responsibility in the family. Usually when a bride and groom cut the cake on their big day, it's for them. They save a piece till their anniversary, they put it in their partner's face, it's fun, whatever they want to do. Often in history, the eldest child would get the first slice. How lucky is that? When it came down to cutting the actual cake too, well, that meant that the bride is no longer a virgin. It's an awkward few bites. Wedding cakes today are delicious and they're pretty much an art form. TV shows are devoted to them, like Cake Boss and other cake shows that I can't think of. If you're lucky, you might find a few cake charms on the inside as well back in the day. Real, non-edible cake charms. You wanted to find these in your cake. They brought good omens to the table. To find a rocking chair meant that you were going to live a long life. An anchor means you're bound for adventure, sailors ahoy. And a purse meant that you would have good fortune. Let's just hope you didn't find the charms with your teeth or else you would be using said new fortune fixing your chiclets. Very metal, very real. <laughs> Not good. At number two, plague flowers. In a lot of weddings, the flowers are very important. There's the flowers for the centerpieces, the bouquets for the bride and bridesmaids. There's flowers everywhere. Get your Benadryl. But why is that? Well, the idea of carrying a bouquet at a wedding dates back to ancient Greece where it was believed that carrying a bouquet was thought to ward off evil spirits, but a little later on down the line, the presence of bouquets at weddings got a little bit darker and a little more precautionary. During the Middle Ages into the Renaissance, when the Black Death was running rampant throughout Europe, people were trying anything and everything to try and ward off the plague. Back then, people believed that smells carried contagion, so people would fill their pockets with fragrant things to keep the plague at bay. This was later integrated into wedding practices and brides started carrying around a bouquet of stinky stuff like garlic and dill to protect them from catching anything. Over the years, the stinky stuff was replaced with nice smelling flowers, but really, no one cares what's in the bouquet anymore because all people want to do is participate in the wedding hunger games and fight to the death to catch the bouquet at the end of the night. Why? Why are we hurting each other for this? Why? And finally, number one, wedding rings. One ring to rule them all. Perhaps the most important piece of the wedding puzzle, rings. Whenever somebody is about to pop the question, everybody around them always needs to see the ring. Congrats, let me see the ring. Oh my God, is it this, is it this? Egyptian pharaohs first used rings to represent this eternal life. The circle has no beginning or ending. They created this concept that we adore to this day. The center of the ring was also believed to be the gateway to the unknown. Finger just disappears, you're like, what the f These Egyptian Ouroboros rings were the first, a snake eating its own tail, hashtag love. When Greeks came in the picture, they took this tradition, started using copper and iron rings in ceremonies, and the iron rings had a key symbol on them, meaning that the wife now has control of the house. If you like it, then you should have put a key on it. Come medieval times, the ring gets another upgrade. Now we have these precious gems to be added to them. A little bit more glam. Rubies symbolized passion, sapphires symbolized the heavens, and diamonds to show strength. Because they were rock hard and obviously you know the rest. Come the 12th century, the Christian church declared marriage as a holy sacrament, so rings were solely used now for that ceremony. That's when the engagement ring came into place. There needed to be another trade or promise that was just as strong as a wedding band. So now there's rings for pretty much everything. All right everywhere right now so obviously covering it first number 10 how a blind date leads to being one in a thousand it's been controversy since day one with Meghan and Harry not because they did anything wrong per se not at least at first more so the usual sensualization drama that has to occur whenever a prince chooses a cool Hollywood gal to be his biddy as you'll learn in this video this was not the first time this has happened the couple met on a 
blind date in 2016, and the relationship was confirmed in November of that year, immediately initiating waves of hatred and bigotry onto the couple for the Megan's ancestry career and how she even breathed. Really anything the media could latch onto. This onslaught is what promoted the couple to step back from the royal family in 2020, and instead splitting time between the UK and North America and finding their own financial endeavors. They also made the rare royal move to take legal action against paparazzi for the excessive negative tabloid attention, part of which was exasperated by Meghan's dad sharing all her personal business with literally anyone who will listen. That's part of the reason Meghan only had one guest of her own at their wedding that contained thousands, her mother. Since their marriage, all the scandal has revolved around the Oprah interview, podcasts, novels, and broadcast interviews. But now, as of this week, it's coming from suspicions that Harry and Meghan are taking a break. This follows Meghan's 20 mil Spotify agreement being cancelled and causing apparent financial plight for two people that are already worth millions of dollars. Evidently, living all your lives out loud in this fashion from day one of a relationship will halt its healthy progression. But a source close to them is saying that this time apart in different continents isn't a breakup, rather time apart couple needs. I want to follow that up with the very similar story of the American divorcee, number nine. Like the gravy and mash that the Brits oh so love, this is scandal ladled on a scandal. In the early 1930s, Wallace Simpson was married to Prince Edward was in line to become the king. By 1934, rumors had already started about the two having an affair, something they insisted that until their dying days never occurred. Anyways, when King George dropped in January of 1936 and Edward is crowned, he calls up Wallace who proceeds to immediately divorce her husband. This now made her a two-time divorcee, something the Prime Minister at the time stressed to Edward as being a bad idea. At the time, divorce was frowned upon, and the thought of a monarch marrying a divorcee, unheard of. Joke's on him though, because by December the Prime Minister is invited to the palace for a dinner where he's told by the new king his plans to marry Wallace anyway and abdicate. The Prime Minister and Edward's mother, Queen Mary, respond pretty much the same. What is wrong with you? Edward's reign lasted 324 days before he abdicated to marry the woman he loved. The couple was married in France on June 3rd of 1937 and promptly shipped to the Bahamas by Edward's family. Why? Oh, well because the real scandal with these two is that they were Yahtzee sympathizers during World War II, a time when their own country was fighting the Germans, the same Germans and dictator, hint hint, that they went and hung out with and encouraged. Yikes. If you want to learn more about royal blunderings like these, be sure to take a second now to subscribe to the hot. Number 8. The Birth Factory Soap and sanitation is one of the greatest things ever invented. Don't you just love taking a hot shower after a long day? Oh, I know I do. Hygiene was not the greatest back then, and while not the only factor, it did contribute to a high infant mortality rate. It was just one of the many factors. So, when young women were married, and married rather quickly, it was time to start pumping babies out. It's more of a quantity over quality kind of thing. Before marriage was declared a holy sacrament, these things were happening everywhere. Pubs, town squares, heck, even in your house. Now, for the people at home, can you tell me how you feel about the holy sanctity of marriage? Especially if you've been married for more than 10 years. Does it feel good? I bet it does. Number 7. Wrapped up. One of the weirdest superstitions and traditions that still carries on today is that the bride cannot be seen by the groom before she walks down the aisle at the wedding. Why? Well, it's bad luck. After all, that could ruin a marriage. Not like any other factors would have a hand in that. Like in-laws from hell or spending way too much money on the wedding, putting you in crippling debt right as you're just about to start your life together, right? Well, this was the way of the medieval wedding, and something used to even keep things mysterious was for the bride to wear a veil. It was thought that it would protect her from evil spirits, but also keep her from being seen by the groom, which honestly sounds like it might have been worse. So when the groom got to unwrap his wife, if he didn't like it, well, sucks to suck, brother. Just imagine your bride walking down the aisle, and then... Yes, I will get married to you. Let's do it. Number 6. Mr. Steal Yo Girl This one's pretty messed up. I'm not even sure how this was even possible, but hey, here we go. So on your wedding night, it was the legal right of feudal lords to come on down to your place and shack up with your soon-to-be wife. What? Who most likely was a virgin? That's right, the government would come down and fornicate with your wife. Sound just like the IRS. Anyway, this messed up tradition is somewhat shrouded in curiosity due to its extremely uncomfortable nature and its legitimacy. It may or may not have happened, or at least if it did, it might not have been as commonplace as some people may think. Moving forward, I think it's safe to say that this tradition can stay in the past, as there's no need for the mayor of my town to be sweet talking to my wife during the wedding. 
Hey, hey, Mr. Mayor, you get your hands off of her. Number five, Mamma Mia. The best man at your wedding was most likely the groom's best friend who he most likely met in college and probably was part of his fraternity. And when given the mic to make a speech that was slightly inappropriate for younger audiences, the most common words of his vocabulary were probably bro and dude. All college friends put aside, the best man of the past had more of a greater responsibility than regaling the tale of the kegger at Stacy's house. Besides the feudal government coming to tickle your wife's fancy, there were others who wished to take the bride away, Bowser style. The best man's job was to prevent any of this from happening. Trying to get away with Koopa kidnapping meant the best man was going to do battle with you. Or just make sure the bride is protected. Like, you know, trying to run away from an arranged marriage because women are treated like property. Basically, he's a Luigi to Mario, except everyone actually respects Luigi in this case. Number 4. Arranged Marriages All this stuff sounds awful, and you might be thinking, why do these women go along with this? Well, it's because they didn't have a choice. A lot of women simply didn't have the right to choose who they married. Kind of a rough time for the ladies. I would also hardly call these marriages marriages as it really was more the lines of something like a business deal or a proposal. Families promise daughters to others. Being basically sold off to someone probably isn't a good feeling. For wealthier families like royals, a lot of times it was just about wealth and power, but also about keeping alliances, keeping borders in check. Your daughter marries my prince, now we're allies. Oh, you've got a son? Great, because I've got a niece that just turned 13. Gross. Number 3. Marital Disputes I like to joke around in this channel. Ah, oh, hell, who am I kidding? I have to joke around all the time. But this is kind of a touchy subject. But it's the truth. Considering everything else that was going on, and it's not that far from the truth to say, that women probably were not respected well inside the home either. This was a time long before equal rights and the resources that women today still need in case of domestic issues. I, as an internet comedian, cannot do the subject justice as it's something of a more sincere conversation to be had. However, I can talk about it from the medieval times. And some men just needed to be put in the naughty corner. Bad. Life was a lot harder for the average average Joe back then, which means it was a lot tougher for the average Jane. Tough conditions don't excuse men treating women that way, but what I'm saying is, it just wasn't a great time overall, especially for the women. Naughty, stay in the naughty corner, you bad medieval men, bad. Number two, mail order. This kind of goes without saying, but men basically just got to pick a wife. Using money, power, or because somebody just owes you a favor. You get to pick out a wife. It was basically like shopping for a new car. You look around, check your options. Remember, this is the time when women were treated as property. Perhaps the biggest divide between men and women back then is that while men treat marriages like business or political agreements, they are still looking for love, where for a woman, she just doesn't have that option. Sometimes marriages go bad, but can you imagine what it would be like to be in a marriage you didn't even want to be in from the start? Man, that's rough. Number one, married games. This one is just too weird not to mention. Divorces were not that common back then, till death do you part, and depending on if the church would even allow it, but however, in the yieldy times, in the land of Germany, there was a really, really messed up process called trial by combat, which basically meant when husbands and wives needed to work something out or separating, they fought for it, Hunger Games style. The man was placed in a hole to level the playing field, and the woman had a sack of rocks that she would use. Not that any married couple today would ever want to hit each other over the head with anything, right? Come on, that's not you guys. You guys love each other. And when this display of happy matrimony was finished and a winner was declared, the other had their light snuffed out. In a nutshell, the only way to divorce or remarry was if your spouse ceased to exist. So, here's some weapons to deal with it. Go ahead, here you go. Crazy. Number 10, Naughty Naughty. There's a reason we don't do things like we did in ye olde times. We didn't know, but now we do. So there's really no excuse for acting up. A very common practice for marriage back in ye olde times was to marry a girl at the age of 12. And in case you're wondering, no, the man was nowhere close to the same age. Yes, it's just as gross as you think. No, I'm not happy talking about it, but that's just the way things went. I can just imagine how happy those young ladies were when their parents came to them and said, listen, the Lord across town fancies you and the dude's got the bag. So you're gonna marry him so mommy and daddy can get the bag too. That's just one example of the medieval business transaction. I mean, marriage. Marriage, marrying for love. <laughs> Number nine, pull up a chair. The people of my generation either struggle to phone the doctor to make an appointment because of crippling anxiety, or they flaunt it on OnlyFans. There's no in between. However, I still think most people would feel uncomfortable finalizing their marriage in front of a party of witnesses. 
I honestly cannot think of a more awkward situation. Do you cheer them on? Are, are there sports commentators talking about the moves? Are there snacks? You can be there for 30 seconds, or 10 minutes depending on who you're watching. It just seems like a lot of unpleasant viewing to walk out of a room later to then all agree that yes, yes indeed, that couple is married now. But hey, that's just how it went. Witnesses or family would watch you do what animals do on the Discovery Channel. Number eight, adultery. There you were, standing like a wallflower at your town's clubhouse. Ours was called the Lions Club, you know what I'm talking about, small towns. Wearing a little old thing your sister lent you. Cowboy boots clatter as the music gets quieter. Then a handsome young man wearing jeans all over took you by the hand. Oh, romantic. You've been together ever since. I'm sure I, I literally just nailed that for some people. That's pretty much how they're married now. Except now he's not as charming. Now now he's got a beer gut and he farts in his sleep. Ugh. Oh well, that's married life. I'm sure the medieval people went through a very similar process. What am I getting at? Well, when you get married, it means you're with that person forever. That includes the bedroom. Well, kings and queens of yieldy times ignored that rule. Besides the obvious political reasons for marrying, which I'll get to later, what was the point of marrying for love if you're just gonna have 30 mistresses or a secret lover? I would list the kings and queens who partook in this, but it would simply be easier to list those that didn't partake in that. You know what I mean though? What's the point? What's the whole point of doing it if you're just gonna, yes, we love you together forever and then, how you doing? It just doesn't make any sense. Number seven, soldier on trial. Things weren't all bad for ladies back in medieval times. Sometimes they were given the benefit of the doubt. Like in medieval France, for example, where if a woman did desire a divorce, there was a non-violent way to get one. She and her husband would meet in front of a group for proceedings regarding their marital prowess in the bedroom. Of course, why else would I be talking about it? Meaning she had to prove that he could not prove himself a man in the bedroom. Happens to a lot of guys. In a nutshell, that means a group of people would handle, grab, stare, and examine a man's gabagool, piche deal, sausage, Woody the Woodpecker, the Olive Branch, the Edmund Fitzgerald, the Ballpark Hot Dog, the Ambassador, the Trombone, the One-Eyed Bob, and the Heat Seeking Trouser Rocket. That's a good one. That's a you guys get the point. It was a very embarrassing process, but if he couldn't produce results in front of prying eyes, then, well, that means she's leaving. Can you imagine that? Number six, no Irish grandma. In society, we've decided that there are rules and laws and just rules that really just need to be followed in order to have an effective society. Like, no harming others or laws that help keep us safe. However, there's some laws that just don't need to be said. Some rules are self-explanatory, like no diving in shallow water. Yeah, that makes sense. You don't wanna hurt yourself. No pooping in public. Of course not. I would never. I promise. And you can't marry your nan. That's right, you can't marry your nan. Yes, that's right. A law from medieval Ireland hits us with a marriage law stating that no man shall marry the wife of his granddad. You see, that's one you didn't have to tell us. We knew that. I knew that. Everybody knew that. Marriage laws were changing at the time because of English rule and a lot of other laws were changing too, but the close family nature of their marriages, well, things got a little confusing. It was just about the time. I'm not allowed to say in sound things, but it was in that's what it was. So they, they were changing laws, but it was kind of gross. Ugh. Now I feel gross talking about it. Number five, the bedroom handbook. Like previously said before, when you marry someone, it's for life. You learn to love, and you do the bedroom dance with that same person for the rest of your life. For some folks, this was their first time. And as we all know, remember, that can be awkward. <sighs> well, imagine if you had a booklet or an instruction manual on what to do when that time comes. Like a Lego manual. Although sometimes even those can be a little confusing. I always have to count the pieces. I get confused. Well, some churches back in the oldie times were doing such a thing. The Sume Confessorum, as it was known to be called. It detailed exactly on what days were allowed to make the devil's dance possible. By the time all the rules were read and followed, you were boiled down to a small window about once a week, or sometimes none at all. And especially not on Sundays. Ooh, you better not do that on Sunday, man. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's the wrong time to do it. Never do it on Sunday. Number four, Dragonborn? This is actually kind of cool. So in Viking and Norse weddings, there was a very unique tradition. 
we'll call it a tradition where the very handsome and brave groom would be tasked with a quest. Like something right out of Skyrim, actually. The groom was tasked with entering his family tomb and retrieving and or placing a ceremonial blade that acknowledges him tying the knot. Now, is that as cool as fighting off drogers and emptying literally every urn you see in search of golden amethyst? No, no it's not. However, I can't recommend entering anyone's grave before the invention of modern medicine. It's just not a great idea. But still cool nonetheless, hence it's on the list. Listen, I just got married. You own grandpa's tomb, go grab that knife. Just go in there. Just go grab it. Grandpa died smallpox. That's okay though. Go in there and grab it. No problem. You come out. <laughs> I got it. And anyway, number three, royal weddings. While poor class citizens did sometimes marry for love and support and to have someone to go through life with as being a woman on her own back then would prove to be quite difficult. Uh, sometimes difficult more than it should have been. Medieval times set a very troubling precedent for those at the top. A lot of times princes, princesses, kings, queens, and really anyone who held power or land were oftentimes married off to benefit that of a nation or a kingdom from which they came. In a nutshell, these marriages were political agreements, not holy matrimony, if you can call it that. Many times in history, nations swapped sons and daughters in order to save a little skin. Some marriages might go sour over time, but imagine one that you didn't want to be in from the start. Oof. And if you speak up, your whole kingdom might collapse. Eee, yeah, not a good, not a good time, not a good scenario. Number two, witnesses. I've talked about it before, but it still doesn't make it any better or easier. Every person you see walking around today was created by a couple things: two people, a Barry White record, and a little bit of friction. Unless you're a test tube baby, sometimes like you're a clone in Camino, you know what I mean? And Star Wars, you know the, the big tube thing. Anyway, that's life. However, a lot of these moments are private, and they probably should be private, unless you're an exhibitionist or something. That's how you do things. Well, a lot of times for a marriage to become official, established members from your village or community would come and watch you consummate the marriage. Yes, that's right. Mom, dad, the bishop, heck, maybe even the grave digger down the road because he's got an important job. My question is, what do you say when that's happening? Do you cheer? Do you laugh? Do you Way to go, kid. You, yeah, that's, that, that's my boy. I don't, what do you do? It's so gross and, ah. Close the door, dad. Number one, divorce by trial. My personal favorite on this list, divorce by trial or divorce by combat. Either or, same thing. It's exactly what it sounds like. What if divorce court had a little less paper signing and a little more club swinging? Sprinkling a little bit of Hunger Games and bam, boom, you got yourself a medieval divorce. It was a fight until you had to call Dompe the Gravedigger. The wife had a sling and a stone, the man had a club and was stuck in a hole ways deep just to even the odds. May the better, may the better spouse win. Whoever was left alive afterwards, got to be live free and then now they were divorced because the other spouse was no longer breathing. Starting who off in our number 10 spot, we have Wards of the King. This messed up marriage tradition comes from the Dark Ages, the medieval times, and during these times, since people were seen less as people and more as what they can provide, orphans who were wealthy female heiresses, as well as wealthy widows, all became Wards of the King. That is dark in itself, but since marriage is all about money, the King used these people to his advantage. These women could be married off to the men of the court who wanted to increase their wealth and land, or a lord who would also be able to sell her marriage to the highest bidder in order to make up for the loss of income she would have provided. If one of these women went and married someone on her own accord, she would then lose the money that was rightfully hers. How absolutely backwards is that? In our number 9 spot today we have the Bridal Bouquet. The Bridal Bouquet is definitely a classic staple in western society now, but it wasn't always just a nice aesthetic touch. The idea of the Bridal Bouquet has a much different history. It is said that ancient Greek brides would often wear wreaths of mint and marigold meant to serve as an aphrodisiac for the newlyweds, but I want to take us over to the middle ages. During this time, things and people were filthy. The concept of hygiene didn't really exist in the way that it does now, and this meant that people were usually pretty smelly. This is why it became tradition for brides walking down the aisle to carry a bouquet that was full of herbs like dill and garlic. The bouquet served as a sort of deodorant for the bride, and it also worked to ward off evil spirits. Sort of like an awesome two for one deal right there in one bouquet. Dill was also like a triple whammy because apparently it too is considered an aphrodisiac. So having some on hand post nuptials pre consummation was just the icing on the cake for the pair. And speaking of, 
love. Number eight will be about marriage to the ex-youth. Uh-oh, if you can put together what I mean by that, y'all know this was a tabloid nightmare. Claus von Amsberg wasn't exactly the spouse people had in mind for the then princess future queen Beatrix of Netherlands. After all, when Claus was younger, he was a member of the Schmittler Youth and later German Army. This was already a problem for plenty of reasons, but the Dutch capital had lost pretty much all of its Jewish population to the horrific oppression and the now finished war. Their romance sparked a storm of protest in the Netherlands as a result. Claus was a low-ranking West German diplomat when he first met Beatrix, the then-crowned princess, on a Swiss ski slope during a winter holiday in February of 1965. They kept things on the DL until she warmed her parents up to the idea of meeting him, and to the surprise of many, Queen Juliana and her husband, Prince Bernhard, approved the match. Maybe it was because Bernhard himself was German-born, or their love was really that swaying, but I'd say part of it was the man himself. Claus initially was regarded as stiff and stern, and he worked really hard to shake off the habit he'd learned in his youth. And be vulnerable, showing a playful side to the public. He flouted royal protocol by removing a necktie during his speech and gave rides on the back of his bike during his wife's birthday. He also made himself favorable by mastering the Dutch language and learning to speak it with very little trace of a German accent. That, and he did give the Netherlands their first male heir in nearly a century. Well, he didn't produce it, Beatrix did, he just helped, you know. He's just Ken. The two remained married in, until his death in 2002. Now here is a name we all know well, but not for this reason. Number seven is Wed in Absentasia. Marie Antoinette and Louis were married before they ever even met. On April 19th, 1770 in Vienna, Marie's older brother, Archduke Ferdinand, was the stand-in for her soon-to-be groom. Ferdinand literally stood at the altar as Mary walked down. They exchanged their vows, exchanged the rings, juries out on if the kiss part happened, but it was actually two days later that Marie left the country for the real deal wedding and groom. If you want to learn more about being wedded in Absentasia, how that works and where it comes from, check Check out my recent vid, The Top 10 Messed Up Marriage Traditions in Ancient Rome. It's on May 16th of 1770 that she and Louis are finally properly married at Versailles, a day after meeting for the first time in person. As was the custom, the groom's grandfather accompanied the newlyweds to the bedchamber. He blessed their bed, kissed them both, left them to produce a royal heir. However, this teenage couple was hiding a dark secret behind bedroom doors. Not only did they not have a baby, but they didn't even try. The couple didn't consummate their marriage for seven years, and it caused a massive scandal. How could they not produce an heir? It was her job as a queen, and Louis need to maintain the royal lineage. Historians have speculated why the couple didn't consummate their marriage all that time. So did the public in the 1700s, but the reasons are usually dumb witchcraft stuff. Nowadays it's assumed maybe Louis had a condition that affected his abilities, or maybe she experienced too much pain when they were trying. Honest answer? I think it's because they were young, the two probably weren't ready, and puberty probably hadn't done its thing and given them the drive. Either way, scandal ensued, and the story ultimately ends with heads rolling. This modern blonde is a different Different story, however, because she came just short of being the, the runaway bride. Number six. As a wedding planner myself, I can tell y'all it's supposed to be tears of joy on your wedding day, not tears of get this bastard away from me right now, so help me God. Which was kind of the vibe that Prince Charlene of Monaco's wedding to Prince Albert II gave. Prince Albert and then Charlene Whitstock met in 2007 at the Mer Nostrum International Swimming Meet in Monaco when Charlene was an Olympic swimmer. They were engaged by 2010 but unfortunately, Albert really liked having extramarital affairs. He had two children out of wedlock, as is, and then, per Vanity Fair to quote, days before the wedding, it was reported that the future bride had attempted to flee Monaco after discovering that Albert, already the father of two illegitimate children, had fathered a third love child during their five-year courtship. Then the video footage of their wedding on July 1st of 2011 pops up, and the bride has just Balling. Photos where she isn't, it's evident her smile is painfully forced. Post wedding and the paternity lawsuit thrown at Albert, Charlene has gone on to insist that the wedding was the happiest day of her life and she felt absolutely zero despair. Her crying was the result of being overwhelmed. Since plenty of rumors of more affairs, potential divorce, and separate homes have arisen, nothing can be confirmed nor denied. And the couple remains married, raising twins. Here's a fun one number five, the Cougar Duchess. According to the Guinness Book of of world records, nobody on earth has held as many titles as the Duchess of Alba named Marie. She was known as a mover and shaker in the European social scene and regularly rubbed shoulders with everyone from royalty to Hollywood stars to ordinary people. With her striking frizzy hair, sometimes dyed red and most of the time white, Maria always displayed an eccentric, often outrageous fashion style. Throughout her 70s and 80s, she wore fishnet stockings and beaded anklets, paired with loud dresses and lavish designer jackets. In other terms, she's your aunt that refuses to age 
bitch has no kids, a cool crib, and pulls up to the family function in fur coat and leather skinnies at age 88. She was a badass. She was also married three times and widowed twice. What caught the public eye was that husband one and two were both younger than Maria. The second husband by 11 years, and then the husband she was married to until she died, that's the one that caused scandal. He was 25 years her junior, Alfonso Carabantes. Spanish King Juan Carlos openly labels Alfonso as a gold digger, hoping to get his hands on Maria's extensive fortune. All of six of her kids are horrified and do the most to try and stop the wedding. But the Duchess told Spanish radio, all of her children have been divorced, so they have no right to give her lectures on morality. I don't know why my children are causing problems. We aren't hurting anyone. Alfonso doesn't want anything. He's renounced everything. He doesn't want anything but me. She said. The couple was said to have had a super happy marriage until her death three years later in November of 2019. And speaking of age, how about the new religion in at number four? At the beginning of Henry VIII's reign in 1509, the British crown showed no signs of wanting to leave Catholicism. Yet when Henry started pining for Anne Boleyn, who refused at first, like unlike the other courtly women and her own sister, to put out no matter what he did, it drove the man crazy with desire, right to the point he made the unprecedented decision to straight up divorce his first wife so he could marry Anne. The first wife, Catherine of Aragon, had been passed down like a family heirloom to Henry when his older brother Arthur died. Henry wasn't the biggest fan and had already been denied an annulment in 1527, so in 1533 Henry just married Anne in secret. She was already pregnant with Elizabeth and the ceremony took place in the middle of the night just before dawn at Whitehall. There was only four or five witnesses, mostly Henry's close friends, and then the marriage was kept under the strictest secrecy because Henry of course didn't have permission from the Pope to divorce, let alone remarry. When the Pope raises a fuss, Henry's reaction is to just casually declare himself the head of the Church of England and completely splinter the religion from Rome, thus starting a whole new branch of a religious faith. As if forcing an entire country to switch religions for your marriage wasn't controversial enough, he later beheaded his wife for reportedly cheating on him. Number three is kind of a cute story, the coupon dress. Though you wouldn't guess it by looking at the dress because honestly it's the best royal wedding dress I've seen come out of British monarchy. But did you know due to the wedding, uh, due to the post-war austerity measures, Princess Elizabeth had to use clothing ration coupons to buy her dress. Determined to get her dream dress despite the doom and gloom the empire was recovering from, Elizabeth, who was just a princess at the time, saved up clothing coupons in order to pay for the materials. She received an additional 200 as a gift from the government and most iconically, Brides to be all around England, excited about her upcoming nuptials, sent her hundreds of their own coupons. Overwhelmed, Elizabeth made sure to return these coupons to every single woman who sent one, especially given it was illegal for them to be given away in the first place. The dress was designed by Norman Hartnell, and what he created was certainly fit for a queen. Chinese silk, high neckline, tailored bodice, and a classic fit and flare silhouette. The ivory silk gown had a 13 foot long train, with the pattern installed by a Boccacelli painting. The extra coupons, it said, went towards the extra materials needed to make it. It's incredible to think that the post-war restraint shown by the Queen in the last 1940s, less than a decade before her coronation. The scandalous nature of using coupons for a dress ironically was an afterthought, mostly pulled up once she became Queen much later to try and besmear her for cheapness. Speaking of Elizabeth, for number two we'll talk about the snub. I don't care for royal drama, but the world knows that Diana was a gem, so Camilla can eat it. As you know, Diana was the lovely bride of Charles the gross cheating weasel. To play devil's advocate, he always wanted Camilla and only her. The queen and other royals kept them apart and as a result poor Diana suffered. Once she met her tragic end, Charles went happily about doting on Camilla as per usual. And now in recent times, as we all know, he married her. That's really it. That's the scandal. Everyone hates these two so much, their marriage alone caused fury amongst everyone, including Elizabeth, who only begrudgingly allowed Charles to finally marry Camilla. Someone Elizabeth called that wicked woman and openly stated, I want nothing to do with her. And number one on the countdown, will it be Catholic or cousin? Which is worse, guys? Which would you rather marry? Well, in 2023, there's nothing wrong with marrying the first option, but you should not be considering the second. Don't do that. But George IV, Prince of Wales, decided married both. In 1785, George secretly married Maria Fitzherbert, a twice divorced commoner. <gasps> I know. To make matters worse, she was Catholic. So not only was this match not approved, but at the time it was super illegal and technically made their marriage invalid. While courts and commoners and nobles alike berated the couple and scathingly referred to Maria as a mistress instead of their queen, these two lived happily together for a super long time. But the prince was a tad broke. He spent all his winnings lavishly in, in order to set Settle the debts he built, the parliament concocted a rather evil scheme. We'll pay it off, give you a new fortune, but you have to publicly deny being married to Maria. Well, 
He left her high and dry, that's to say the least. George is then set up by the same parliament with a dashing young lass, his first cousin, named Princess Caroline of Brunswick. The two were not attracted to each other, had nothing in common, nothing to talk about, didn't even like each other. A match made in heaven, obviously. They agreed to a marriage which was commenced on the 8th of April, 1795, the first day they ever meet in person.